Well, welcome to Path Point Fellowship Church. We're so glad you're with us. I mean, I got to sleep an hour later today. Did I know? I talked to many of you, and you said, yeah, uh, I woke up like I normally do on Sunday morning, and I said to myself, go back to sleep, go back to sleep. But it didn't work. Right, Kelsey? Yeah, I get you. But it's so good to look across this audience this morning and see each and every one of you. Uh, for uh, many of you, you, don't, you didn't know what the second service looked like and the people attending it and vice versa. Well, now you're, you can rub shoulders with each other. Uh, throughout the summers, we go to this one service event on Sunday at 10.30 a.m. Didn't our praise and worship team do awesome this morning? Amen. <laughs> Give them a big hand clap. Yeah. Uh, look at this definition. A miracle is defined as a surprising event that cannot be explained by either natural or scientific laws. It is considered to be the work of the divine, a supernatural act. And this is what we've been talking about in our series, Do It Again, This Miracle, Miracles, amen. Um, I want us to continue our series, Do It Again, and I want to continue to remind you of some of the miracles we see in Scripture. One, which is in the book of Genesis, when the prophet, uh, he, uh, when the prophet has been sent to the brook Cherith, Elijah, and he's there by God's direction so that he can sustain him throughout a, a, a major drought and famine in the nation of Israel at that time. And so ravens would come in during the day and bring, bringing bread, and then he would drink water from the brook. But there came a point in time when the brook dried up, and God told him, Now, Elijah, you're going to need to go into this town. And uh, so he did. He obeyed God. Amen? You hear the voice of God. You hear his voice. Don't let anybody tell you differently. You hear him, and he's talking to you. And just like he was Elijah, he went to that little town, and there he saw a woman at the well. She was drawing water, and he, they got caught up in a conversation with one another. And as she's about to leave, he says, uh, uh, go bring me some bread. And the woman said to him, Sir, I have a little oil and I have a little cake, a little meal. I'm going to make a little cake, and me and my son are going to eat it and die. And Elijah the prophet said, bring me the cake first. Bring it to me first. And she did. How I many you know God will always give you a choice? He'll never demand it of you. He will just bring you to a fork in the road. You can do what you want to do. Or you can do what he tells you to do. Amen. 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 And so he went, she went, and she cooked that cake and brought it to the, the prophet. And the Bible says that from that day forward, all throughout the famine and beyond, her meal, nor did her oil, dry up. Amen. But lasted throughout that whole time and fed her son and herself. Amen. amen. Let me ask you this. Yeah, Amen. Let me ask you this question today. Is your path sustainable? Will your path that you're on sustain you? This is what Lance, Pastor Lance, was talking about earlier. The path that he was on, even though he's a Christian, even though he was going through the Sunday morning experience, he came here and he found out that over a period of time that his path really wasn't sustainable. It wasn't anything like he thought it would be or he thought it was. Amen. And so many times God brings miracles into our life to uh, either take us off of the path we're on and put us on a path of sustainability. And I want to talk about that today in a session that I've titled Miracles of Multiplication. Miracles of Multiplication. I want us to begin with a familiar miracle that took place in Luke, the fifth chapter. There's Jesus. He's on the shores of a certain lake, and he's teaching to a small group of people. And as he continues to preach, it continues to grow. And it begins to grow into a crowd, and they begin to push him to the water's edge. And Jesus, out of the corner of, eye, of his eye, sees two boats. So he walks over there. He steps up in the boat. And for the next two hours, he continues to preach, just like I'm going to today. Welcome to the 1030. <laughs> just seeing if I got your attention. Yeah. 
And so he stepped up in the boat, and Jesus did what he did, you know. And he concluded his message, and when he did, he looked over and he began to speak to the man who owned these two boats. And he said, if you'll, if you'll take your boats right now, and you'll go right over there, and you throw out your net, you'll catch fish. And this man, uh, who's been over there with his crew cleaning their nets from the night before, he begins to argue with Jesus. I've actually had people do this to me as well. Say, preacher, just stay in your lane. You preach, I'll stay in my lane, and I'll fish. Yeah. And uh, so uh, Jesus just asked the question. I've done this too. Uh, yeah, well, how's that going? How's that going for you? You fished last night. Did you catch anything? Well, uh, actually, I haven't. and We didn't. And he said, well, how about the night? No. How long has it been since you caught fish? Well, it's been several weeks. We just had a, a streak of bad luck. But you know, lady luck's on our side tonight. The odds are in our favor. And Jesus said, you can do that all you want. Or you can go right over there right now, and you'll catch fish. And he stopped arguing, and he started agreeing. And he haphazardly went over there, threw his nets in a boat, one boat. Remember, he has two, just one boat. Him and a couple of his crewmen, and they row over there, and he throws his net out, and he's nonchalant about it, but then when he puts a tug on it, he recognizes, I didn't just catch a tin can. <laughs> Some of you fishermen, that's all you catch. <laughs> and so they begin to pull on the net, and, and, uh, and as they bring up the fish, their boat begins to sink, and so he calls out, to his business partners and says, join us. Luke the 5th chapter, verse 6. And they join him as well, and they do the same thing, and they catch a boat sinking load of fish. Now, I want us to just take this familiar story that we've heard so many times, but I want us to stop. I want you to imagine the moment, the exhilaration. Imagine the excitement. These men, uh, once they get back to shore, they're jumping up and down and they're giddy and, and they're, they're celebrating and doing high fives and, and they're just excited because the reality is breakthrough has finally happened. Who's looking for breakthrough today? Who's needing a breakthrough today? Who's wanting a breakthrough today? See, this is where they're at. This is where they're at. They've been waiting for this breakthrough for weeks and even months. And finally, they've hit pay dirt, so to speak. Finally, this financial drought has come to an end. How many of you ready for your financial drought to come to an end? Amen. And so here's Peter. This is who we're talking about, Simon Peter. But let me ask you this. How many of you ever played the lottery? You know, you bought the ticket and you swore you're gonna, you were going to win the lottery. Yeah. And so here, here comes the ball. You've got the first four uh, numbers right. If I can just get to, yes, yes, I got, those numbers are mine. I just won the lottery. I finally hit the jackpot. This is how Peter feels. And he immediately begins to think about what he's going to do. Well, you know what? I'm going to go down, down there and buy me that new RV. And me and my family, we're going to go on an extended vacation. My wife won't be able to argue with me now. I'm going to go down and buy that sports car. You know, I've been looking at this Boston whaler down at the marina for the last five years. I'm going to go buy that boat, and I'm going to take my fishing business to a whole nother level. What would you do if you won the lottery? Hmm? Because imagine, imagine what's going on. Here, here are these men, and they've had bad luck for a long, long time. Nothing has worked out their way at whatsoever. And here they find themselves full of excitement and celebration. And there's laughter. And the weight of scarcity and lack has fallen off of them. And they're lighthearted. And Peter's thinking, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to ask this preacher to become my businessman. I mean, after all, he's a pretty good fish finder. 
maybe for 10% of the profits. I'll cut him in for 10% of the profits. You know, Jesus didn't enter Peter's life to enhance his reputation, to advance his fishing career, to thicken his wallet. Or did he? You see, every day, somewhere, someone has Jesus fill their nets and overload their boats. And the first they think, thing they think about is, am I going to buy, I think I'm going to go buy that new RV. I think I'm going to add on to my business. I think I'm going to go buy that new sports car. No, even better than that, I'm going to buy that new ski boat. But this miracle specifically came with a loaded question. Peter, follow me. Follow me. Jesus has made Peter wealthy overnight and then says, follow me. Follow me. And Peter's thinking to himself, why would Jesus... To do this miracle of multiplication in my life and then turn around and say, follow me. And he's thinking through the process just like you and I would. I mean, just 24 hours ago, I was fed up with his job, with his business. I was ready to walk away. I was so tired and worn out. I mean, there's nothing worse than having a business and every time you show at the job, you're losing money. I'm ready to walk away from this thing. But then, 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 here comes this miracle. Payday has finally happened. And Peter's thinking this. Why would Jesus perform this miracle of multiplication, get everything going my way, only to get me to walk away? You ever ask that question? Why do I have it so good? Because of God's miracle of multiplication that he did in my life. And now he's saying, what are you going to do with the miracle that I brought into your world? What are you going to do with it? What would you do? What should you do with the result of that miracle? I can tell you're thinking. That's a good question. (laughs) You see... Jesus doesn't have a problem with those things. Not at all. But it's like I've been telling you for years. It's motive. It's all about motive. It's all about why. Why? Why you do what you do. Amen? And oftentimes we find ourselves in the same place Peter was in and his crew looking for and needing a miracle from God. It could be in the area of finances, but it could be in the area of healing. It could be in in many other areas. And our our motive is, okay, I need need this miracle. I want this miracle because I know what it can do in my life. I know how it can cause me to progress and move forward and better my family and better my surroundings and the atmosphere and so on and so forth. But God is wanting to get something across to us. You see, Jesus didn't do this miracle of multiplication To make Peter a wealthy man. He did this miracle of multiplication in Peter's life to get closer to Peter. He wants to get closer to Peter. You know, there are many people who they're looking for a God. The kind of God that will follow them. I want you to let that sink in. And so here comes God, and he steps into your boat and fills your nets, and then you say, thank you, Jesus. thank you, Lord. I'll call you the next time fishing gets scarce again. And we live from one problem to the next, and that's the only time we talk to God is when we have a problem or when we're in need. 
And this is the dilemma of where the church sits in this generation and why. And why we're here. And we wait and we wait and we wait and we wait and we wait. And then sure enough, here comes some problem. Here comes some tragedy. Here comes some sickness. Here comes some diagnosis. Here comes some cancer. And then all of a sudden we go into crisis mode. You know, let me, let me, let me just say this to you right now. Peter's charter trips. <laughs> I think that's what we can call them. You know what they teach us? That there are a group of people that just prefer to live a predictable life. They prefer to keep their life settled and quiet and serene and safe. They prefer a safe God who keeps his distance instead of a God who's up close and personal and gets inside your, your head and gets inside your heart and gets inside your everyday dealings because you've invited him there because he won't, he, because he won't get involved in an area that you keep saying no to. Amen. Amen. But this is what Peter's charter trips teach us. So many Christians desire to have a relationship with a God who is safe. A God who won't upset their schedule. And who won't require too much of them. Amen. But how many of you know God requires faith? He requires faith. Amen. Amen. I, uh, I've heard people say, man, you, you, you guys, uh, you guys, y'all just have a deep message. Well, are you, that tells me that you want to live your life hugging the shoreline instead of venturing out into the deep. That, that's just too spiritual. H hold on. This generation doesn't need spiritual friends. They need spiritual fathers Amen. who will speak up. And say, this is what God is saying. And this is, no, this isn't just what God's saying. No, this is how God feels. This is how God feels. You see, the redemptive gift prophecy, uh, they, that, that redemptive gift hears the thoughts of God. They're literally inside God's mind. But the redemptive gift mercy feels the heart of God. They feel how God and their emotional and their emotions come out of how God feels about a situation. Amen. And there are many people, I've seen this over the years, there are many people, they'd rather hear how God thinks instead of how God feels. No, no, at this church we show you and we, we prove it to you how God feels. This is how God feels about that. He's emotional about that. He's emotional towards that. Isn't it time that as long as God has been reaching down from heaven towards humanity, isn't it time that by faith we reach up and at least meet him halfway? Amen. And the kingdom of God is not a kingdom of logic. It's not a kingdom of, a kingdom of reason. It's not a kingdom of understanding. It is a kingdom that requires our faith. And kingdom logic is not human logic. And it's a kingdom of opposite. And it requires us. And look at how long it took Jesus to finally convince Simon Peter to get up and just go out there. I promise you there's fish. They're waiting on you there. And he's still going to sit there and argue with him for a, over a half an hour before he goes out and actually does what he tells him to do. How long does it take for God to talk to you about something, but it requires your motion, it requires your steps before the miracle is ever going to be produced in your life. And, the, and the, tr the truth is this. If a miracle hasn't happened in your life, could it be that God's told you to do something? You just had not done it yet, and until you do it, the miracle ain't coming. Come on, somebody. 
The Bible says, draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. Come near to God and then he'll come near to you. How many times over the years have I asked people that? I, have I asked people, uh, who, who do you think is going to make the, take the first step? And they say, God is. And I'd say, no, he's not, honey. You're going to have to. You're going to have to. What does that first step look like for you? Could it be that you actually show up here, those of you on Facebook? Could it be that you need to put your pills down? That you're over-medicated? You don't need spiritual friends. You need a spiritual father. Could it be that you need to put down your apathy? And actually become hungry and thirsty for God instead of hungry and thirsty for every tantalizing thing the world has to offer. Amen. God has a miracle waiting on you. But the path you're on is unsustainable. And you're going to find yourself, if you stay on that path, at a dead end, at a dead end, at a dead end. And yet the Lord is speaking out to you today. Not out of the thoughts, out of his thoughts. No, I feel his presence. I feel his, how he feels about it. Amen. Now, let's go from Luke the 5th chapter and let's jump over here to John the 21st chapter and let's look at this Event. Later, Jesus appeared once again to a group of his disciples by Lake Galilee. It happened one day while Peter, Thomas, the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, Jacob, John, and two of their disciples were all together. Catch up, hurry. Uh, Peter told him, told them, I'm going fishing. And they all replied, we'll go with you. So they went out and fished through the night but caught nothing. Then, set, then at dawn, Jesus was standing there on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize it was Jesus. Wow. He called out to them saying, hey, guys, did you catch any fish? Not a thing, they replied. Jesus shouted to them, throw your net over the starboard side. For those of you who don't know about mariner language, that is the right side of the boat when you're facing forward in the ship. And Jesus shouted to them, throw your net over the starboard side and you'll catch some. And so they did as he said, and they caught so many fish they couldn't even pull in the net. Now, I may have fooled you with this story. Because this is the same miracle... This, this event happened not once, it happened twice. Same miracle to the same person three years apart. It happened to Simon Peter. This is after Jesus' resurrection. And yet Jesus, look at him, Jesus is performing the same miracle to the same person. Because he still can't get him to straighten up. <laughs> it's one thing for God to have to tell you twice. Some of you are saying 10 times. I see your hand. <laughs> it's another thing for him to have to do the same miracle. Again and again and again. But that's what's happening here to Simon Peter. Amen? Peter. And yet many of us are Peter's. We're the Simon Peters. We need, to God, we need God to do that same miracle again. And have we had him do the same miracle again? Missy and I can vouch for that. Yes, we have. We absolutely have. And there he is. Amen. <laughs> what this tells us is, once again, is that God has performed, Jesus in this case, has performed the miracle of multiplication to get Peter closer to him. What is the purpose for the miracle? That's the question we have to ask. When God does a miracle in our life, and it's a miracle of multiplication, what is it that we do with it? Because we have a tendency to just step back 
and we go with every whim and every idea and everything that we've always wanted, and we just say, we're going to do this, 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 this. Again, ask the question, if I won the lottery today, how many, how many, how many of you families, you bought the lottery ticket, and you said, now, if we win the lottery, here's what we're going to do. Oh, yeah, and, you know, we'll give God something, too. I remember when, um, I remember when uh, my family was poor, and we would go down to the store. All four of us kids would be in the back seat. And I remember us saying, when we grow up and have our own money, when I go to the store, I'm going to buy me, this is what I would say. Every one of us had a different thing. I don't remember theirs, but I remember mine. I said, I'm going to buy those pecan sandy cookies, and I'm going to eat the whole box. <laughs> and I'm not sharing with anybody. <laughs> See, that was me in my poverty. I'm dreaming about. And what do we dream about when we're in our scarcity and lack? We dream about winning the lottery, and the first thing we go to do is we upsize our life. That's the first thing we think about. Instead of going back to the Father and saying, why did you get in my boat, fill my nets? Produce the miracle of multiplication. And then I, and then I do this. Okay, Father, I'll take it from here. What? Are you kidding? Now's not the time to take it. Because if you do, you will find yourself where the fishing becomes scarce again. But if you'll just let him, without any assumption, if you'll just let him take the lead and you'll just surrender to his guidance, you'll never be in lack again. Amen. Amen. Now, we built this uh, miracle scale. So you can see that these are miracle markers. Every one of you, at some point in time in your life, God has come into your world and He has performed a miracle on your behalf. Whether you're aware of it or not, whether you recognized and acknowledged that he did that or not, he has. He has. But miracles come to disrupt. Miracles come to get our attention and disrupt what is. So that we can see what a relationship with God can really look like. Okay? It's one thing to have a miracle but these, mar these miracle markers are for us to stop and to build a monument to him. And to say, I'll never forget this day. And the way we do that is we write it down. We write it down. You would think, now over the years as I've talked to people about just journaling the things in your life and journal those things that God has done for you, you would have thought that I'd ask him to go out here, start naked, and run down the highway for 100 miles. <laughs> like it's the hardest thing for them to do. Right. Write the flipping thing down. Yeah. Because that's the way you're acknowledging him. God did this for me. And then what will happen is in your prayer time, God will say, go back to your journal. And look at that. And you'll open the page up and you'll go, oh, that's right. I forgot all about that. I forgot all about that. But he came, he came with a miracle marker to mark your life. And to tell you, you didn't do that. I did it. I did it. I did it. I did it for you. I did it for your family. I did it because I love you. It endears you to him. And he to you. Because he comes to get our attention with miracles. In order to disrupt our lives. And to say, your life isn't supposed to look like this. It's, to po it's supposed to look better. And he does that with signs, wonders, and miracles. 
God has called us to the realm of wonder. Amen? So when God does a miracle in your life, it's to get you closer to Him. It's because He wants to get close to you. Closer than you, you two have ever been before. Amen? You know, there's 40 documented miracles recorded in the book of Acts. Each one of those miracles were to get the body of Christ, the church, closer to Him. Amen? We lose sight of why God performs the miracle of multiplication. Now, I'm reminded of something that happened years ago when we were uh, still meeting at the Cole Center in Canyon, Texas. Those days we did a Sunday morning, a Sunday night, and a Wednesday night service. I'm speaking here about the miracle of multiplication. And so it was on a Wednesday night. And I think we might have had 65, 70 people there. And uh, I had called Missy earlier that afternoon. And I said, Missy, I need you to go by the bank today. And I need you to get me 15 $20 bills. I mean, there's going to be 65, 70 people there. Surely there won't be more than 15 people that need this. And so she went by the bank, and so when we got there at church that night, then I just, was, I just followed the direction of the Holy Spirit, and he led me to this. And so um, at the end of the service, I had an altar call, and I had these people come up that needed a financial breakthrough. And so um, as they came up, Missy came up with the envelope, and then she went down through there and counted, and she said, I went by the bank, did what you said. I got 15 $20 bills but you understand there's 21 people up here tonight. And I said, well, you do. I, I didn't know that. So I just reached in my wallet, and I, know, I, I knew I had a, at least a 20 in there, so I reached in my wallet, I had three $20 bills, and I just took my three $20 bills, and I put them inside the same envelope with the other 15. And she said, yeah, you're three short. What are we going to do now? I said, I'm going to do what God told me to do. Just like that. And she, give Missy a hand clap for putting up with me. Jeez. God bless you. <laughs> he is risen indeed, yeah. Uh, that's your statement. And anyway, I got, to the, I got to the first person, and what happened is I just laid hands on people. I would reach in and... Missy just kept holding in the envelope, and I just reached in, hand him twenty dollar bill, and then do this. And I'd got down, I got went down the line, got to the fifteenth person. I've lost count. I've lost count. I'm not thinking about it. I, I, are you kidding me? When you're in the middle of a miracle, you don't sit there and reason with it. You just sit there and say, "No, but God, I'm going to do this because God told me to do it, and let it sort out however it may." Amen. But man, you talk about putting. See, that doesn't even put any pressure on God. Now, we think it does because he's got to perform now. But he is a master at ceremony. He is a master at demonstration. He is a master at doing what humanity can't do. And so I reached down there, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th. 21, and Missy opened the envelope and said, that's it. I don't know where the other three 20s came from, but I know it was a miracle of multiplication. Amen. 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 Now, why did God do that? Well, uh, we got stories back. Okay, we had one lady that was there. She didn't go to our church. She lived in some other community in another state, and she just happened to be there with a friend. And she came up, and she got one of the $20 bills, and we laid hands on her. She wrote us, and, and we, got the, we got the letter like three or four weeks later, and she said she was able to sell one of her horses for $350,000. She said, my life turned around. How many of you watched the Kentucky Derby yesterday? Come on. All right. True story. True story. So we got a few weeks out of that. 
on the other side of that. And one day I'm praying, and I'm just thanking the Lord for what he did that night. Thank you, Father, for making me not look like an idiot. Thank you, Father, <laughs> for, for demonstrating. Thank you, Lord, for coming and validating and confirming with this sign and this wonder and the miracle. It's not much. It was 60 bucks. But you did it. I didn't. You did it, and I appreciate you validating Amen. this ministry. And uh, all of a sudden, on the inside of me, remember my redemptive gift says that I feel the heart of God. I feel how he feels about things. I felt him grieving. And I said, Father, why are you grieving about that? He said, because not one of them did what I told them to do after I did that for them. Not one of them. And I learned something. When God multiplies you, when he comes and brings that miracle and you experience breakthrough, the first thing to do is ask the question, now what? Now what, Father? What was the purpose of this miracle? What was the purpose of this job promotion? What was the purpose of this a new job you gave me or this pay raise that you gave me what was what's the purpose of it because there's something to it there's something to it this year the lord gave us remember the prophecy and let me get about halfway through it he said multiplication is on its way it will come in the areas of need and desire so be steadfast and say, be multiplied, you fill in the blank, be multiplied, multiplication in whatever, it is, whatever area it is you need him in is mine. Not only stands the reason that the Holy Spirit would lead us over here to teach about the miracle of multiplication in light of the prophecy that he gave us for this year, that multiplication is on its way. Now let me ask you this question. And I would like for you to raise your hand. How many already, so January, February, March, and April, you're just a few days into the May, but in this four months you've already experienced multiplication. Raise your hand. Look at that. Look at that. And you ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. Now, I, I'm saying that, and I'm saying that and attaching this as an addendum to this message. Pay attention. Pay attention. Listen to what he's saying to you. Okay? Because this is a not this is not a one-off thing where he brings a miracle of multiplication then and then I've done my job and off he goes. No, I've done the miracle of multiplication. Now what? Amen. Now what? Amen. Now what? And watch what God does with you. Now, he'll do this in any area where you need multiplication. It, it can be in finances, but can, it can be in other areas. Some of us just need multiplication in the area of common sense. It's a true story. We need multiplication in the area of wisdom. But not human wisdom. The wisdom of God. Amen. The wisdom that's got you where you're at is not the wisdom that will take you where he wants, to, wants you to go. It will not get you there. The miracles that God has performed in your life that has got you where you're at are not the miracles that are going to take you where he wants you to go. And so the purpose of what? Uh, bring that scale back up. The purpose of this is continual throughout our life, throughout our journey. Look at it. To continue to go all the way to you where you cannot separate you from God and God from you. Amen. Inseparable. Did you get anything out of this this morning? Give the Lord praise in this house. Look at this next step. And then we're going to get, we have some business. To, today, today's next step comes as a question. 
what will you do with your miracle? Now, when I ask that, say, uh, Frankie, say that out loud. What will I do with that miracle? What will I do with that miracle? Audrey, say that out loud. What will I do with my miracle? What will I do with my miracle? Now, what does that get you thinking about? What does it get you expecting? What am I going to do with my miracle? <laughs> you see why the Holy Spirit led us that way? <laughs> when I get that miracle, what am I going to do with it? Now, before it happens, then ask the Lord. Now, Lord, when you bring me that miracle, tell me what you want to do. Tell me what you want to do. Tell me what you want to do. Amen. When you do that, the purpose for him sending you the miracle will be exactly what he wanted you to do with it. And that just sets you up for the next one. Amen. Give the Lord praise one more time. <laughs> and my speech and my preaching is not with persuasive words of human information and knowledge. But my speech and my preaching is with the demonstration and the power of the Holy Ghost. That people's faith would not stand in human, human knowledge and information. But that men's faith, that people's faith would stand in the wisdom of God and in the power of God. Amen. It's time for the power of God to be released upon the body of Christ. Amen. For demonstration to become a normal thing, not something that happens every once in a while. It should be something that happens and that we're familiar with. That it's, it never gets too old just because we're familiar with it. But it should be something that we expect and that we anticipate and that we say, Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. It's time to lay hands on the sick. And they'll recover. It's not time to pray for the sick and they stay sick. It's time to pray the prayer of faith. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise them up. Amen.